Good morning. Good morning. And Ray is is helping on the technical side of it. I think this this is our uh, variability group. Um, we're going to jump right in because we don't have a whole lot of time. Ray, I believe you're sharing slides. There we go. So the the, the game plan here is to go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to read all this to you, but basically what we've asked Parker and Trang to do is to each give a, some thoughts on the results of their modeling work that addresses interannual variability and ocean and river impact. And again, these, 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 these breakout groups are intended not to solve all these questions or to go do a deep dive, but rather to get the wheels turning. We intend to have workshops later in the year on you know a full workshop on this topic. So this is really just to sort of kick off. So um, that's what we're going to do. We would appreciate any input you have and put it in the chat of who, we, who else should be involved in an inner variability, inner annual variability workshop um, going, going forward. So we'll for ideas there. Um, Ray, is there anything else we need to say? You're recording any other tee up stuff we need to do before we jump into presentations? Where's no, I don't believe so. That all sounds good. Um, Question though, are we going to wait to the end to answer questions after both of them have presented? Or are we going to ask questions after individual presentations? Let's do um, let's do clarifying questions, short clarifying questions if there's any burning things after each, and then we'll get into the into the discussion. Okay. Okay. So with that, um, let's turn it over to Parker McCready, who is going to uh, give us his thoughts on his work on nutrient loadings. Hi, can you hear me? Perfect, and see your slides. Great, and um, okay. I can't see myself, but that's okay. So <laughs> um, I am a um, uh, at the School of Oceanography, University of Washington. I'm a physical oceanographer. I work mainly on coasts and estuaries, especially in this region. And in recent years, I've been running a realistic simulation of the, the region, including biogeochemistry and uh, very similar to what Tarang does and also Susan Allen at the University of British Columbia. And today I'll be talking um, generally about nutrient loadings, especially from the ocean. What you see on the right is just a recent image from this of surface nitrate from the model I run, a thing called Live Ocean. You see the high nitrate in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, General DIN or dissolved inorganic nitrogen comes from rivers, human sources, and mostly from the ocean through the estuarine exchange flow. And um, we'd like to know about the variability of these things on various time scales, long ones, short ones, especially climate change. And then we also want to be able to consider how these might affect um, our ability to make decisions about or to understand the consequences of our decisions, the uh, uncertainty question that was mentioned uh, in the previous talk. Next slide, please. So here's the um, a little ocean context. There's uh, just from a place offshore of the Washington coast you see in the map on the right. And these are profiles of uh, nitrate versus depth and oxygen versus depth. And the big feature to be aware of is just that there's a region centered around a thousand meters or just a little higher called the oxygen minimum zone, very low, nearly anoxic water there. And it coincides uh, naturally with a high nitrate zone. You can see above this, uh, above a thousand meters, there's very strong gradients of these properties. And so it's, um, uh, of course, the surface is influenced by biological productivity that draws down nitrate and, and pushes up oxygen. In between, there's a variety of other currents, which I'll mention in a second. Uh, but this big feature sitting offshore, the oxygen minimum zone, is just part of the global circulation pattern that some of the, um, the water in the mid-depth Pacific is some of the oldest water in the ocean, and it it's low, it's high nitrate and low oxygen ref reflect uh, this accumulated remineralization of, of sinking organic particles. Next slide, please. Then um, thinking about the water that comes into the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca through the estuarine exchange flow, um, it, the, um, it's 
pretty complicated. It's a mixture of waters coming from the south, the uh, Pacific equatorial water comes in the California undercurrent. And then there's also the Pacific subarctic upper water from the Northwest Pacific. And that drifts across the ocean might take, you know, seven or 10 years to um, uh, cross the Pacific from, um, uh, uh, from the Northwest Pacific. So it inherits a lot of whatever variability is along the way. Um, next slide. So the, uh, there are some nice observations from long-term uh, uh, time series at what's called the Newport line off of Oregon. And so these are sections of dissolved oxygen from a more recent period in the middle and then uh, more like 40 years ago on the left. And the color is the oxygen. You can see this oxygen minimum zone is that black line around uh, 800 meters depth. And that um, there's these strong gradients. And you can see also that the strong gradients get drawn up onto the shelf. And that's the effect of the coastal upwelling that Martha mentioned. Now, the interesting thing also that you can see in this is the difference of the two showing that at kind of the 200 meter depth and up onto the shelf, there's been a noted notable like 20 milligram um, micromoles per kilogram uh, decrease in oxygen. So about 20% of the signal there uh, over the last 40 years. So there's a, um, a, a long-term decline in, um, in oxygen there. But as I mentioned, these there's such strong gradients, the actual depth that the inflow comes into the Strait of Juan de Fuca could be very important. Next slide. Um, looking inside Puget Sound, again, this is from data, not a model. Uh, you can also get a sense of long-term, um, previous slide, please. You can get a sense of long-term variation of water properties. This is from Hood Canal in, uh, and you can see this is four properties, uh, temperature, salinity, oxygen, nitrate uh, over the months of the year using really old data and newer data. And so for example, in the, the um, temperature uh, plot, the, um, the solid red line shows uh, kind of present day, uh, temperature versus month. And then the dotted line shows uh, past like 1930s or 40s uh, era um, temperature near the surface. And you can see that Hood Canal actually has a pretty strong signal. It's warmed in the surface waters. It's gotten uh, fresher. And the um, below that, the dissolved oxygen has decreased notably. Um, so this is, uh, this is just what's happened historically, sort of climate change in the past. And in Maine Basin, the signal is a little more muted, but largely it's all gotten warmer by about one degree C. Next slide, please. Here's uh, results from an important paper that's a uh, observationally based nutrient budget of, or a nitrogen budget of Strait of Georgia, the biggest part of the Salish Sea done by uh, Sutton et al. in a 20, 2013 paper. And um, the, uh, the estuarine exchange flow is that uh, import flux that on the left and the, uh, the outgoing part is the export flux. If you, uh, and then there's various estimates of all the things coming in like rivers, pulp mills, uh, wastewater treatment plants and so on. And so this is a, this is a really nice thing. If you, um, and one thing that I found is interesting looking through the literature is ways of talking about the uh, ocean source. If you um, look at the import flux and compare it to the wastewater treatment plant, you'll see the wastewater treatment plant is quite negligible compared to the import flux. If you consider the ocean source to be the difference between uh, import and export, then the, um, the all the other sources are about, um, 40% uh, compared to the ocean source. So much more important, uh, I think, in the Sutton et al. paper, they would argue um, that the import flux is the thing to look at. Next slide, please. It, here's a similar budget from uh, a model of uh, the, the region, that thing called Live Ocean, that 
that I run, and it's for uh, just one year, uh, 2018, and just for the Puget Sound volume, in, in contrast. And then now instead of uh, annual means, you're looking at uh, time series. And what I've plotted in the top, the main thing to look at is the red curve, which is the net uh, DIN flux into the system through the, the uh, seaward end of the uh, Admiralty Inlet. And it has a, um, oh, it, the, the, it, now this is the sum of the in, the in, inflow and the outflow, the, uh, the two parts of the exchange flow. And you see it has an interesting annual cycle. Um, it's quite weak in the winters and then big in the summers, largely because the outflow has so much less nitrate. And there, there's a notab notable spring leap cycle, those big peaks. But then in the lower plot, if you look at the things that this uh, net ocean flux is made of, uh, it's a very large import, the black line, and a very large uh, export, which is the gray line. And uh, so the, the net is a, just a small difference of the import and the export. Uh, next slide. The, um, uh, in general, I think the, it's the, um, uh, the import part of that, that's the most important thing to be aware of when you think about what the, uh, uh, when you think about the ocean's influence on the system. Um, if uh, back in the uh, 2011 um, report by Muhammad Ali et al, they um, uh, made calculations of the net ocean uh, inflow, comparing it to rivers and wastewater treatment plants. But what they used in that case was the, the net, the, the difference between the inflow and outflow, actually using rather old um, uh, estimates from the Marcus and Harrison 1997 um, paper, and uh, found that it's that by this measure, the wastewater treatment plants were potentially quite important, or the, all the rivers and wastewater treatment plants were like, you know, 50% um, or half as big as the ocean. Um, but if you use numbers from the model I just showed, you find um, and just compare the inflow, um, the net loading of DIN from the inflowing branch of the estuarine exchange flow, the fraction due to rivers and wastewater treatment plants is only about 4%. The part due to wastewater treatment plants alone is 2.5%. And this is probably a more correct uh, way of looking at things if you're just trying to get a back of the envelope estimate of the, the importance of the ocean. And uh, this, was, this was recognized in um, more recent, the um, ecology reports, the uh, 2019 report. They, they started using the ocean inflow instead of the net. Uh, but they used pretty old estimates that are about a third of what I showed. And okay, um, next slide. This is the last slide actually. So just based on you know these back of the envelope type of calculations, and this is consistent with what people have been saying for a long time. Um, the source, the ocean source water is is you know very important. And uh, so its variability is likely to be quite important. Um, I think it's a really interesting and open question for from the point of view of what we're here to talk about if is whether or not the variability of the ocean source water is important for uncertainty estimates. And that's because the type of, of um, experiments we do in you know making these water quality uh, um, judgments is really you know model versus the same model without wastewater treatment plants. So in, in that sense, the, the ocean source has exactly the same variability. So maybe it's variability doesn't matter. And then last thoughts about um, generally for biogeochemical modeling, there's things that we have a lot less knowledge about than we should in order to be doing this job right, um, especially phytoplankton growth rates, zooplankton grazing rates. Uh, uh, photosynthetically active radiation versus depth in active phytoplankton fields, organic particle fluxes, there's only a few real measurements of that, and benthic fluxes, likewise, uh, very few observations in Puget Sound. And that's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Parker. Are there any quick clarifying questions?
for Parker. We will have hopefully a time for discussion later, but we do need to get on the trying. Is there just a quick clarification? That's a clap, not a hand. Okay. Sorry if I went if I went too long. No worries, no worries. It's an academic ten minutes. Let's move on to here. Now let's, let's move on to trying. Okay. All right. But actually, I had a quick uh, clarifying question, if I may. Uh, it's coming out of your time. You can yeah, that's you okay. I will go fast. <laughs> Plus, uh, this is really straightforward stuff that I'm going to present. Nothing complex. The the estimates were they based on the work in Georgia Basin, or did you do the exchange and nutrient exchange coming into Puget Sound? Because I think ecologist numbers were relative to Puget Sound. Um, the the one that I showed the the line plot of time series that was for Puget Sound. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thank you. All right. So my talk is about the response of Salish Sea to to inter annual variability that we experience uh, as we go through year to year, and there's nothing surprising about this. We know that. There are changes to forcings, both from ocean side and river loading side. Uh, but we wanted to see how CLC model, how responsive it is to, to changes such as the marine heat wave that we experience. And so, so what I'm presenting today is something that I presented before. It was um, propagation of the marine heat wave through the CLC, but today we'll focus on the interannual interannual variability aspect of the work right uh, my colleagues are adi and sukyun from the celic modeling center at udab and lakshita from pnnl julie kister from udab oceanography and julia boss who used to be at ecology now at king county next slide please Yeah, as, as I mentioned, the motivation was the marine heat wave. Uh, as we prepared this LEC model, we have a certain way of setting up the model with ocean boundaries and river loading. And we wanted to see how responsive it is to marine heat wave going through our system. So this slide simply tells what, what happened based on the data. Um, you know, marine heat wave was noticed by Nick Bond and, and, and it was a blob of hot water that hung around in the Pacific Northwest coast. It was noticed in 2013, 2014, but really arrived on our continental shelf in the middle of 2014, and then um, entered Puget Sound and Strait of Georgia, Salish Sea. And he characterized it as lack of cooling as opposed to added warming because the blob really stood out in winter months. Next slide. Again, the real motivation was, you know, while much was written about the blob and marine heat wave on the continental shelf uh, with reports of, you know, harmful algal blooms, you know, all those bulleted lists that you see as temperature increases as high as six degrees at certain locations. There weren't that many reports from inner Salish Sea itself. And so, there was a lot of anecdotal talk about, okay, we were at this dock and I've never seen water this warm where I live and things of that nature, but there, were, there weren't quantitative published studies on the impacts of the marine heat wave going through Salish Sea. Uh, but there was actually uh, documented uh, reports of increased zooplankton mass based on the work that Julie Keister did. So there was noticeable increase in phytoplankton and resulting increase in zooplankton based on data. And we wanted to see if this would just come out of our standard model that's been set up uh, for the Salish Sea. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, in our standard setup of the Salish Sea model, we have on the left-hand side of the panel, uh, 160 inflows from the rivers uh, that come into Salish Sea. We also have 99 wastewater treatment plant flows. And Department of Ecology has set up a logistical derivation method of estimating the flows and time series based on monitoring 
conducted by USGS at major rivers, at major gauges. The, the CLC model itself consists of uh, two parts. One is the hydrodynamic portions based on finite volume coastal ocean model and a biogeochemical MPZD style model uh, that does full biogeochemistry. It's called FBCOM ICM, a code that we developed to work with FBCOM. Okay. So it requires ocean boundary uh, conditions. Those ocean boundary conditions in the right panel are provided by a model called HICOM. And a regression that was developed by Yuda Parker's group actually provided us the regression between temperature salinity and water quality variables such as dissolved oxygen and nitrate and so on. And then on meteorology, the model is forced by weather research forecasting implementation. And we, depending on what's available, we sometimes use the weather research forecasting by Yuda uh, group lift masses group. Uh, in later years, we have started to use the HRRR, which is the NOAA implementation of weather research forecasting model. And so we use our standard methods of setting up the model and set it up from year 2013, which was before blob impinging on our coastline until 2017, which is just after the blob heating effects abated. And, and so next slide, please. So we felt by doing so, we are going through before blob after, and then through the blob after blob, and we are getting as much interannual <laughs> variation as you possibly could expect in five years. Okay. And so on the right-hand side, uh, you see our standard comparison or model validation, validation of predicted model results with observed data. And I've, we have just shown plots of temperature, nitrate, phytoplankton, mesozooplankton, dissolved oxygen, pH as conventional water quality variables of interest. Uh, comparing them at 23 different stations where Washington State Department of Col Ecology collects data on a monthly basis. And the model was shown to perform within uh, its standard skill, which is you know, root mean square error uh, of less than one degree with all stations combined for temperature, salinity less than one PPT, and dissolved oxygen less than one milligram per liter, uh, averaged over all stations, right? So we felt the model was performing to its specifications well. Now, to find out what happened during the blob or to, to separate out the effect of marine heating that we experienced during the blob, we, need to, we needed to compare it with reference condition. Now, Nick Bond and others who have always talked about blob, they always referred to blob relative to a 10 year average, climatological average uh, of the ocean conditions from 1999 to 2009. So for the ocean boundary, we developed a refer reference condition, which is based on an average of those 10 years from 1999 to 2009. For the blob, however, we wanted to find out, we wanted to take a difference between heating relative to just before the blob and after the blob, because blob is very specific to local temporal conditions as opposed to some historical reference. So our scenario, the reference scenario included ocean boundary at a climatological average and a reference heat flux, which was average of heat flux before and after the blob. Okay, so next slide please. And so we ran these two scenarios and subtracted them to see the effects of the heat wave going through Puget Sound. On the x-axis, you have years, and on the y-axis, you have temperature. And each panel is the station that starts from the continental shelf boundary. And you see how the heat wave comes in around September. Uh, it reaches, it, it reaches Mia Bay, and then through October, November, uh, by, by December, January, the peak heat wave has already reached South Puget Sound. But this is winter. 
So what was noticeable that in the middle of winter and throughout from 2015, 16, and 17, temperatures remained warm over almost the entire water column until the heat wave dissipated after 2017. Next slide, please. And so we immediately went to zooplankton because that was something that was noticed in, in Puget Sound. And, and we were really happy that the model responded. The top right column shows absorbed mesozooplankton data in Puget Sound with the model reproducing the variation among all different stations, but also the median values throughout the four years, starting from 2014, where zooplankton were relatively low, and they really picked up biomass towards later part of the year. Right? So this high growth of algae and zooplankton uh, comes because of, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second. But anyway, it's, it's, it's from, high biological mass in the water column, which also then produces organic matter, which decays in the water column, that causes hypoxia. And so the plot below is a time series of hypoxic volume, right? So hypoxic volume, if you see in 2013, is relatively low. And hypoxic volume really picks up by 2015, 2016, before it coming down later in 2017. And it's still high in 2018. It takes time for that hypoxic volume to go down, right? So at first we thought, yeah, okay, this is temperature effect. But then we ran the reference condition for the same years and plotted the hypoxic volume, which is the line in red. What we found is that this increase in biological activity uh, happened with or without the blob. So both, both scenarios with and without the heating still produce this high level of biological activity in years 2014, 15, and 16. And in fact, with the heating, the, the biological activity actually reduced a little bit. And we think that's because higher heat produced stronger stratification, which reduced the amount of diffusive flux from below uh, the, the picnoc line into the photic zone. Next slide, please. So to take a closer look at it, we then examine total freshwater flow going into Salisy. The plot on the top shows variability in total freshwater loads to Puget Sound, uh, to Salisy. And you, you can see this year to year, there is quite a bit of variation in total flow that comes in. The flows from 20, 13, 14, 15, 16, the blob years were not that different from the variability that you see in all the other years. But if you look closely, it is a period of four sustained high flow years following a low flow year in 2013. And then that translate into affecting the exchange, the strength of exchange flow. So year 2013, exchange flow is low. Year 2014, we would expect exchange flow to go up, but high flows in 2014 don't happen until end of year 2014. So effect of high freshwater flow is reflected in exchange flow in 2015. So there is a year lag between the plots above and plot below. Uh, we end up with high strength exchange flow coming into Sea in years 2015, 2016, and 2017. Okay. Next slide, please. And we, we and that shape of higher exchange flow is reflected in higher zooplankton biomass. So at first we thought this is strictly heating of marine heat, you know, the strictly heating effect from marine heat wave. Uh, then we thought, hey, it's a combination of marine heat wave and hydrology, because we have made the assumption so far that hydrology is not affected by heat wave, but now we also recognize that much of the strength of exchange flow that comes in through state of Andafuka is, is controlled by Fraser River. And Fraser River is a snow melt, uh, is dominated by snow melt. So it's quite possible that Fraser River flow was affected by heat wave. Nonetheless, all this, all this is academic. There was plenty of interannual variability which affected primary productivity. And so for this workshop, the point is that 
year to year, uh, changes in ocean conditions and loading, freshwater loading from rivers can affect biological response and therefore affect dissolved oxygen in the water column. And my last and final slide, model uncertainty. All models have uncertainty. CLC model is not any different from that. And I completely agree with uh, Gordon's comment previously that a detailed uncertainty analysis is warranted. So we are just waiting for opportunity and support to, to put the model through a traditional detailed uncertainty analysis. And like all models, there are places where we know we can improve higher resolution in some cases, but improved calibration for some of the constituents. Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing that stood out, but here we are, open for questions. <laughs> thank you, Tarang, thank you, Parker. So we have um, about 10 or 12 minutes for discussion and questions. And uh, again, use the hand raise function if you, maybe while you're figuring out how to do that or finding your mute button, I'll ask Park, I had just a quick question. I should know the answer to this, but I don't, so I'll just ask you in public. So the 20% decline in dissolved oxygen over that time period on the coastal water, is that decline expected to continue into the future? What do we, you know, what's your, what's your uh, forecast for what the dissolved oxygen trend is gonna be? Um, yeah, I don't know. It, <laughs> okay. it, there, there was a, you know, a notable decline in dissolved oxygen over long time scales at seen at station Papa. Right. And it just had to do with like changes in weather and ventilation over the, you know, in the Sea of Akotsk or somewhere. And, and then that translating into different um, properties of what eventually drifted across to the Pacific. There, there is a general trend of deoxygenation in the, in the Pacific, um, the North Pacific. So, uh, I guess, you know, the, certainly warming is likely to exacerbate that just because of, of, um, of, uh, solubility issue. Yeah. Would you, would you, if you had to do something, would you assume a 20% continued 20% decline or over time or what would you do? Oh, that's a good question. Probably. Yeah. I would, yeah, I would certainly answer, so. use that as something to, uh, to, you know, to try out. Yeah. to see if it made a difference. That, that's a good estimate of the scale of variability. Yeah, great, thanks. Trang. Yeah, I was just going to say, we have done the future downscale uh, projections of climate change and uh, the, the uh, global climate models, uh, ocean models, they are predicting for the high emission scenario a drop in dissolved oxygen of by 1.7 milligrams per liter or so on the continental shelf. I'm sorry, over what time scale was that? Uh, projected to 2095. So, okay. yeah. Okay, good. I mean, not good. Could we, could we have enough investment? Other questions, comments? Think about, also, if you can put it in the chat if you want to raise your hand, think about um, what you would like to see in a workshop on this topic um, in the fall into the winter, winter months. Um, Renee. USGS. Hello. <clears throat> um, how is climate change expected to change coastal upwelling intensity and nutrient inputs? Okay. Um, Parker, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Well, in terms of uh, nutrient inputs, do you mean nutrient inputs from the land? Or from the from upwelling, upwelled nutrients. Oh, yeah. Um, I've I've seen some uh, climate modeling guesses about how upwelling will change, and I, um, yeah, I can't say I'm enough of an expert in that to know. Uh, maybe Tarang has a better knowledge of that literature. Yeah, I I would point you to couple of papers that we have written on this topic in terms of climate change effects propagation into Salish Sea. Uh, in both papers, we use the results from global climate modeling you know, uh, projections for the Pacific Northwest coast. And just like the dissolved oxygen decreasing trend, 
there is a similar trend in decreasing in, in increasing nitrate concentrations or nutrient concentrations on the continental shelf. I don't have the rate right now, but there is a certain percent increase projected for 2095, similar to the percent decrease projected for dissolved oxygen. In terms of intensity of wind or upwelling, I have no idea whether winds are going to intensify or decrease. Uh, yeah, I would, I would put that in the category of things that is pretty hard for me to have confidence in climate model projections about yeah. that particular subject, but maybe we'll get better at it. Thank and you. Roberts. Yeah, I had a question for Parker that something that came up when you were talking about the Sutton findings. Um, so that you were talking about this whole question of how much should we care about the difference between nutrient input, import, and export flux from the ocean versus just looking at the import? And I was wondering if you know if there's anybody who's looked at the how the variability of the import flux year to year may affect the export flux. Because if if the import flux increases by you know 20 units and the export flux also increases by 20 units. Then it suggests the variability isn't what's important; it's the difference that matters, right? Um, I the what goes out is the consequence of what came in plus a lot of biology, and that so uh, I I wouldn't be I'm not. I don't think it's the most important thing to be concerned with in terms of variability. I think just, you know, times of year and different years that you're pulling in more ocean nitrate, that's kind of, I think, much more relevant to uh, to the subject here um, and how it gets distributed it around the Puget Sound is critically important. You know, did if there was, if you doubled the amount of ocean nitrate, but it only got, to, you know, to Admiralty Inlet and then went back out, then that's not important. Uh, but if it went all the way in and was, pre, you know, present everywhere, then that is important. Um, uh, yeah. Durang, did you have, um, I know you've done some some nice modeling uh, of subjects like this. Um, yeah, Parker, the, the only thing I want to mention is irrespective of the varying uh, magnitude of incoming nutrients, the photic zone still empties out. That is, algae seem to be quite capable of consuming everything that ocean brings their way, <laughs> right? under natural conditions. And uh, in all these years, these photic zone or surface layer nitrate nutrient concentration went down to close to zero. That means algae just grew more <laughs> if there was more. And so, so we still have the situation that in the summer, photic zone is devoid of nitrate and still nutrient limited. And so that's why we end up seeing a response to anthropogenic loads, which may come directly to the surface. And so, but but the, the, the discussion is good because it's not a fixed value that can be just based on one year. We have to acknowledge year to year, there are variations and it's good to examine more, more years uh, before, before advising on nutrient reduction actions. So I see Dick Feely has a question in the chat and I'll just read it. Um, are there parts of Puget Sound, are, are there parts of South Puget Sound or Hood Canal that would be more affected by anthropogenic sources of nutrients? So could you speak a little bit to the spatial vulnerability of the system to, to anthropogenic nutrient loads? Maybe Christopher Krems, I see he's there as well could, could weigh in on that or anyone else. Well, you know, the one place in South Puget Sound is Bud Inlet because it has a big sewage treatment plant uh, right at the head of the inlet and, you know, fairly constricted circulation. And it's been the subject of lots of past studies. And in fact, it's the one sewage treatment plant that has tertiary treatment in the region, as far as I know, still.
Yeah. yeah. Well, my take on that is, yeah, there are parts of Puget Sound which are highly stratified and likely to react stronger to, to changes in nutrient loads to other places like middle of Puget Sound where high or on top of Admiralty Inlet where you have heavy mixing and lots of dilution available. So Hood Canal and Saratoga Passage, which are most fueled like in their vertical distribution structure with a very sharp delineation of the out surface outflow or stratified layer, uh, probably react strongest to changes in nutrient loads. Great, thanks. Let me, I have one other question that may not be totally on mark with you too, but are there concerns about or how important would you think, you know, episodic flooding of coastal wetlands or you know, Puget Sound wetlands, you know, as with sea level rise and increased storm intensity and all those things, is there like increased probability of getting slugs of nitrogen in just from flooding those systems that maybe have been building up nitrogen for a long time? And you know, do, you, do you think about areas of, in your models where the sea level rise is going to increase the nutrient flux? I know. It, <laughs> it's, it could be. I don't yeah. know. It's, yeah. it's not. I don't think of it as my biggest point of concern. Uh, but okay. you know, there's places like like Nisqually where they they opened up all the dikes and that changed things a lot. Um, sometimes the way they manage Capital Lake can bring right. lugs of stuff out, uh, but that changes year to year depending on the management and that, how they operate the dam. Yes, the nutrient loads that are going into the agriculture is actually reaching the surrounding rivers. There may be a lag between when the fertilizer is applied, but eventually the rainwater has to be cleared so that crops can grow. And there are agriculture ditch ditches and the dike district manages those ditches and there are tide gates and that water is reaching cities. Yeah, I just think, yeah, I agree. I, I just think more of like, as we restore some of these, you know, return some of these, these ag lands to, to, you know, you know, habitat, are we inadvertently releasing a bunch of nitrogen? I'll, I'll leave you on that, but we're gonna get kicked off of the, getting texts from Mario. The, the marshes and eelgrass beds and restoration is seen as a way to capture nutrients right, yeah. out, uh, provided we harvest them and take them away and don't let right. them decay. Yeah. I think we're, I, I'm not good, we're automatically going to get kicked out of this in like 10 seconds. So that's totally out of our control. So thanks to both Trang and Parker for the presentations and for the discussion. Again, anything you put in the chat, any questions you have, we'll, we'll address and look forward to another workshop on this topic. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Thanks.